Let's turn to John chapter 3, or pardon me, James chapter 3. And I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the Word of God today. Would you please stand? God's Word is the most important, I believe, what we have today in our lives, that His Word is powerful. And we thank Him and we praise Him for His Word. James begins this chapter where he's talking about taming the tongue. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone, is, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships, for example. Although they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants them to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of our body but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals and birds, reptiles, Sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But, and here I believe is the crux of our whole message today. But no man being, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father with a tongue we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. May God add his blessing to his word today. You may be seated. Well, the first thing I put on my notes is wow, wow. <laughs> I mean, thank you, Pastor Steve, for giving me this awesome <laughs> message about taming the tongue. <laughs> I think we're all feeling today very inadequate because as James says, no human being can tame the tongue. So who can tame the tongue? You know, he begins with the awesome responsibility of the teachers and pastors. You know that Jesus gave teachers and pastors, along with apostles, prophets, and evangelists, he gave teachers and pastors to the church. And so your pastor is a gift from God. Amen? Your pastor is a gift from God. And so he gave them. But he, he gives us that awesome responsibility. And he shows us in that first verse how serious it is to preach the word of God. Amen? Amen? And you know, when God calls a pastor, when I remember when God called me, he's, he didn't say, you go tell a philosopher's story. He said, you preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. Amen? And so today, let's take God's word and thank him and praise him for it today. And then the tongue though small, has power of life and death. The Bible brings this out 
that in Proverbs 18, the power of the tongue, it has power of life and of death. In verse 5, as we read here in the scripture, in verse 5 it says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is small and it's boastful and it can set a great uncontrolled fire. And we've seen that many times, the destruction of fires. In verse 6, it's like a small spark becoming like a raging fire. And so consider that, that what a forest is set on fire by a small spark. And we've seen that in this area, what fire can do, what one spark can do in setting a fire out of it. But you know, John the Baptist came and he said, he pointed to Jesus. He said, I baptize you with water, but he that comes after me, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with what? And with fire. So there is something good about fire, amen? I believe the Holy Spirit is a symbol of that because when he comes and into our hearts and our lives, he starts to cleanse, amen? He starts to purify our hearts and our lives. Linda's, my wife's, my wife who has been with me for 59 years and has been a part of my ministry. And I say, bless you today, Linda. I bless you today. But her dad, who was a pastor, but he worked in Southern Oregon, he worked in a nickel mine. In that mine, they heated the furnaces 3,300 degrees. And they took the ore, the raw ore from the mountain. They brought it down and put it into these furnaces. And there, that was melted down until pretty soon something came out. It was pure nickel. Amen? What happened to the dross and all of that? I worked that first summer when we got married in what they call the pit. I was in the pit. <laughs> you know, but God brings us out of the pit. Amen? <laughs> he sets our feet on the solid rock, Christ Jesus. Amen? And I saw the slag come off, and it was thrown out. But this silver came out, and they kept it, and they piled it up because it was worth so much. And that's what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. And then the next point, no human can tame the tongue. Verses 3 and 4, it says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses, make them obey us, then turn the whole animal or take ships, for example, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. And so we see man can tame the horses. He can tame animals. And if you've ever tamed a wild horse, you know they have no direction. They're just out there going. They're, they don't have direction. Until you put a bridle in their mouth, that gives them direction, amen? And so, uh, what a picture here that man uh, can tame horses, he can drive large ships with a small rudder and steer them, he can tame many animals, it goes on in verse 7 and 8, that he can tame small, he can tame many animals says all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But, verse 8, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And so no human being can tame the tongue. Thirdly, only God. See, the question, if no human being can tame the tongue. Who can tame the tongue? Only God, who made us, 
made our tongue, can tame the tongue. He does this through, I believe, the agent of God that is at work in the world today, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Can tame our tongue. And that then only God can do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the, the tongue, the praises uh, to the Lord, we use the tongue to praise God and then to curse men. He gives us examples here in how we can use it. Praising and cursing cannot flow from the same mouth, yet that is what we try to do. And it's, it's like mixing salt water with pure water, with fresh water, he says. And so can, can out of the same stream, can there be salt water and fresh water? He says, no. It's either fresh water or salt water. And Jesus taught in John chapter 7, verse 37, 38, he said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And so the Holy Spirit came as that agent of God working in our hearts today and brings us the only hope that our tongue can be tamed. Jesus then in John, and you go through chapter 14, 15, and 16, you have the teachings of Jesus before he went to the cross. Now, these are some of the last words of Jesus, and I believe they're important today. In John chapter 14 and verse 15 through 21. I don't know if we have those, but I'm going to read those. It says, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, Jesus said. And so he promised to send the Holy Spirit and that he would be our comforter, he would be our guide, he would be our advocate, the one who comes alongside. And he goes to chapter 15, verse 26 and 27. He calls it the spirit of, of truth. He says, when the advocate or the helper, our helper, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. That's very significant. Okay, we have here the, the spirit of truth. He is truth. He is our helper. He is our advocate, one who comes alongside to help us and to, to help us to speak what's right, to help us to do what's right, to help us to be what God wants us to be. He is our helper. He is the spirit of truth. And thank God, he comes from the Father. And then we can testify with our tongue and with our mouth about Jesus. And then in chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what, the, what he hears, and he will tell you what is to come. He will glorify me because it is from that he will, he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. 
This is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. And so the Holy Spirit then will take the things of Jesus and what he taught and what he says, and the Holy Spirit will make them real in our hearts, in our lives. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He makes the words of Jesus and Jesus real in our hearts. Jesus becomes real and real every single day when we submit our lives to God, when we submit our lives to the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit take charge of not only our actions, but our words. And we allow the Spirit to speak and allow him to show us Jesus. The last words of Jesus recorded in Acts chapter 1. Beginning with verse 4, he said, on one, it says, on one occasion while Jesus was eating with his disciples, he gave them this command. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he said to them, because they were worried about the times and the places that they were in, he said, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set in his own authority, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses for me, Jesus said, both in Jerusalem, both in Wenatchee, both in East Wenatchee, both in Jerusalem and Judea, in the state of Washington, in Samaria, and to the other most parts of the world. You will be witnesses for me. How are we going to do that, friends? By the power of the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells within us. Amen? That's what Jesus is teaching us and showing us that it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can speak the word of God, that we can show people that Jesus is alive, that he is well, that he is our Lord and he is our Savior. He is the only hope for this world. We proclaim that in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So God wants us to speak those words and Acts 2, did they obey Jesus when he said, you go to Jerusalem and you tarry? You wait at least 10 days and you will receive the promise of the Father. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen? As the Spirit gave them utterance. And so God wants to help us to speak His will and His word by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember Peter? Peter cursed and said, I don't know, Jesus, before Pentecost, right? And now Peter was here on the day of Pentecost. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. What happened to Peter? If you read on in Acts chapter 2, Peter got up. He said, these people are not drunk with new wine. He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel in Joel chapter 2. In the last days, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, both the young and the old. The, old, the young men will see visions. The old people will dream dreams. And my handmaids and on all people, he said, I will pour out of my spirit. And so Peter went on to preach a message about Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, and what he means and what he can do. And what happened? 3,000 souls were saved that day. 3,000 souls came to Jesus. Why? He didn't preach the philosophy of Pluto or somebody else. He 
spoke the word of a living God and he spoke about Jesus Christ, the living Savior who now is alive at the right hand of God and who will touch every life and every soul that comes to him. He will touch our hearts and he will touch our lives and we can speak of Jesus because he is alive and he is the only reason that we stand here today, that we sit here today because of what Jesus did for us. Amen? Thank God. Amen? Praise God. Thank him. Praise him. Give him glory. Give him praise. Give him honor. Because that's why he gave us our voice to praise and honor and glorify him. I was saved when I was nine years old. I walked down an aisle. My dad had died when I was two. Everybody was older than me. I was 11th of 12. I said, what significance do I have? But when I walked down that aisle, on that Sunday morning in a little basement church in Powers Lake, North Dakota, something happened in me. Jesus came into my heart and he made me alive in him. Amen. He gave me eternal life as I opened my heart to him. And then one day in that same church, I sat down right in the front. This was on a Sunday night as we were raiding in the presence of God. And I believe that's biblical. We wait in God's presence. My brother, who was a farm worker, told me just this week, he said, you know, God was dealing with me for several months. He said, I want you to go preach. And I said, I can't do it. I'm just a farm boy. He was on his knees for a couple hours at least that night. You see, we waited in the presence of God. Pretty soon he got up from his knees. He came up to the pulpit. He opened his Bible. He began to preach the word. He began to preach the word. God said, this is your call because I will be with your mouth and I will anoint you. And I sat there and I said, praise God, that's my brother. You can call him because he's the talker in our family because I could hardly talk. I'd had a bicycle accident. I knocked my front teeth out. I sang every Christmas. All, all I want for Christmas is my four front teeth. <laughs> so I sat there I said thank you God for calling Clarence he said you know I'm calling you I said no you got the wrong one I can't talk in front of people remember Moses when God called Moses to go to talk to Pharaoh to bring the children of Israel out what did he say he said, I can't speak. I, I can't talk very good. No, God said, but what? I will be with your mouth. Amen. And that's what God told me that day. He said, you may not be able to speak and you think, but he said, you know you can't do it in yourself, but through my Holy Spirit, you can speak the word of a living God. And that was God's call in my life. I was saved. I was filled with the Spirit in that church. And I was called into the ministry. Today, as I go down in my study that my family built, thank God for my family today. I thank God every day for my family. Bless, 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 bless your family. Bless your wife. Bless your children. Bless your grandchildren. Amen. That's what needs to come out of our mouth. We need to bless them and bless them. And thank God 
because they built me a study where I could get all my books and my Bibles out of my boxes, put them around me, and I began to study and pray and seek God. I had a restart. This was just about a year ago in my life. As I went down and sat in the presence of God, read his word, and the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart. And one day, God, the Holy Spirit said, now you need to go out. And you need to use what I have put into you. And you need to tell others about Jesus. I said, oh, where do I go? And immediately, the mall in East Wenatchee came to mind. And so I said, okay, Lord. My brother, by the way, who was in the ministry for 60-some years, retired, 88, goes to the mall in Oregon City every day almost. He's led more people to Jesus than I know. And so thank God that we can use our mouths. And as I went to the mall, I was obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I came in there. I said, Lord, what do I say? He said, go tell them, whoever you see, that Jesus loves them and has a wonderful plan for their lives. And so I came in, and here was the coffee barn. I went by. I saw two girls. I waved at them. I came around, came back, and the Lord said, go tell them that I love them. And I have a wonderful plan. I went and told them. They lit up like a Christmas tree. I can still go back and they say, hi, Vern, how are you doing? I have contact. I went one day and I walked by a little, little shop. I saw a girl, a young girl back there work, working in there. The Holy Spirit said, now's the time. I went in there. Angela stood there. And I went up to her, I said, Angela, do you know that God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life? She said, no, I don't know that. And by then I had a tool that I could use for that, if I can find it here. Okay, that's my tool. <laughs> Looks like a $5 bill, but it has a message on the back. It says, Jesus will never disappoint you it gives John 3.16, and it helps him to find Jesus. And so that's what I told her. Tears began to come down her eyes. I went back in there. I said, Andrea, did you pray that prayer? She said, I don't know how to pray. Can you pray with me? I prayed with her that day. She invited Jesus into her heart. Thank God he gives us the words to speak. And in closing today, and over and over again, just this week, I've, four young men I gave that to, and I was able to tell them, Jesus loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. But I want to share this in closing today. On Wednesday morning, while still in bed, I was worshiping and asking the Lord how I should close the message. I, remi I was reminded how powerful prayer is, and praying for children. I remembered my mother who had prayed for all of her children, and I believe that six of them now are, are in heaven who had gone astray, but now are in heaven because of her prayers. She was widowed, but she prayed. The Holy Spirit began to pour a word into my spirit, so I called Linda. I said, write it down. Here's the message. Then the words of Isaiah 43. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who framed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the floods, the river, it will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither will the flames consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, your Savior, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will guard your lips I will, and your mouth. You shall speak my words. I am your Father God. I will never leave you or forsake you, for you 
are my vessel and my spirit will flow through you. I w and this is a word I believe to many here today. I will give you strength. My word is life. My word is nigh in your mouth. Speak it out. It will not return to me void, but will accomplish what I please. God is calling you, especially young people, I believe, today. God is calling you. He will take what you give him. And when you yield your will, your tongue, your all to him, he will use you for his glory and others will come to Jesus through you and your life. Thank you, Father, for your word. Speak to our hearts. And as we stand, as we sing this last song, I'm going to invite, first of all, young people, if, if you're under 25, would you come? Our prayer team is coming today. They're going to stand in the front. And I'm going to ask the young people under 25 years old, and if you are 25 and you feel God calling, you come too. And then later, I want anyone to come. And we're going to yield ourselves. We're go I'm going to yield my voice. I'm going to yield my spirit to God again today. So let's stand and open our hearts. But come, young people, come. Uh, prayer team, please come and stand in the front. And young people, God has something special for every single one of you. They're coming now, and God's going to use them for his glory. Amen.